I don't want to take up too much time given that uh, Naira has to leave at five. Uh, but just to set some context to this discussion, uh, when we were looking at your uh, your profile, we uh, we thought you know one one issue that really resonates with us is uh, the fact that we we inherited uh, the British bureaucracy uh, when Britain itself has has uh, somehow at least to some extent managed to rid itself of it. Uh, but uh, the, the theme we chose was something that uh, the uh, Prime Minister uh, emphasized right through his campaign, um, minimum government, maximum governance. And uh, we're all grappling with you know, how this is to be accomplished. How do we reduce the size of government uh, on the one hand and also improve its effectiveness on the other? Uh, there have been a number of initiatives, uh, I can, I, you know, going back perhaps the last 30 years, uh, every few years, there is this cry to, to reform the, the governance system, make it more accountable, make it more efficient, make it smaller. And most of these essentially end up uh, at, at best achieving incremental change. Uh, so there are two sets of perspectives I think we need to bring into this, uh, this debate. Uh, one is what's going on globally. I don't know if we, we have enough uh, of a sense of how different systems have, have gone through their own reform process, and perhaps I think your, your, your uh, experience with global governance or, or the evolution of governance systems globally uh, will, I think, be of enormous value. Uh, and the other is, uh, while civil service reform is, is one aspect of uh, governance reform, uh, I think you need to look at it in a larger context of the various compacts that governance involves. And I've been thinking in terms of uh, four elements. There's, there's the, the political class, the bureaucracy, uh, business, and the citizen. And in a sense, what governance is, broadly speaking, is how uh, the relationships between these four okay. elements, one can expand this if necessary, but how the relationship between these four elements is managed, uh, how, how the interests of, of all of them are, are aligned and uh, hopefully, you know, uh, the, the end result is is improved welfare, broadly speaking. Uh, Pratap's been writing on on some of these issues in his uh, regular columns, so uh, I'd be glad to hear from you on this larger. Process. I think the issue of the soft aspects, the trust, is something you've been emphasizing. And Dr. Ghosh, uh, former civil servant, uh, was directly involved in, in uh, the more recent civil service reform agenda, so that's a perspective that we hope to have from him. But there are, of course, many of you who've been part of the system or have been observing closely, so we hope to get into a, into a, a live engagement on all these issues. So, Nari, I'd ask you to, to lead off, perhaps uh, 10 minutes or so, and uh, you know, then I'll pass it on to Pratap. Thank you for coming again. Thank you very much, and what a pleasure to be here, and thank you all for being here. Um, at Oxford University, we are trying to build a school of government which really can help empower and inform and strengthen governments around the world. That's unashamedly our goal. It's premised on an observation that there is no citizen in any community anywhere in the world that we've ever found that doesn't wish they were better governed <laughs> anywhere. Um, so everywhere people yearn for better government, which doesn't mean more government, but it certainly means better government. And that the great academic institutions of the world, including Oxford University, could do more to step towards supporting and strengthening better government. And so that's what we're trying to do. Um, I guess to kick off what I hope is just going to be an interactive discussion uh, today, I thought I'd just say, I'd just answer two questions really. So when Prime Minister Modi announced minimum government, maximum governance, there was something very alluring about that statement. And I'd like to just talk about a couple of reasons why I think it's so alluring and attractive, and then talk about a couple of elements of it which are perhaps unalluring and unattractive because they give us some caveats to it, which I think are quite important as we look towards a set of changes that many people in this room will be a part of, commenting on, a part of implementing, a part of thinking about. And let me just say huge thanks to the Brookings Institution India 
a young, extraordinarily rapidly growing think tank, part of a discussion in Delhi around government, which we think is a, is a, is a great thing uh, for, for government to have. So what's, what's alluring about this slogan? I think the first thing that's alluring is the idea of, obviously, of minimum government, that a smaller, smarter, more efficient government comprising cleverer people um, who have better skills is going to be better than an overweening bureaucracy. And I think all, what I would say about that, and we had a discussion about this over, over lunch today, <coughs> is that certainly what I was being told at lunch is that a big part of India's less effective government apparatus is a civil service which operates more by entitlement than performance. That you do the entrance exam, you're then stamped for life, and you can then spend your life being instead of doing. And that if we think about that system and think about how to change that system, it's not a system that's only going to change if you start laterally hiring or bringing new people into the system. Because the problem in the system isn't the people, it's the fact that the people are not being expected or managed to perform. So what you need to introduce into that system is really good measures of public sector performance, not measures of private sector performance. We know from other governments, you know, the Singaporean government, that if you take private sector measures of performance and apply them to government, you transactionalize performance, which is not what you want to do in the public sector. But that should not be used as an excuse for simply letting people sit with status and entitlement and not perform and not deliver results. So it really struck me in that conversation that minimum government is an alluring idea, but to achieve this minimum efficient, effective government will require bringing a way of measuring performance and promoting people by performance into every level of the Indian civil service. I think the second alluring part of this minimum government, maximum governance, is the idea of maximum governance. The idea that government can never be large enough and well-informed enough to regulate on its own. If you take the failure of the British and American governments to regulate their financial se services sectors, and you think about the fact that at the height of the post-2008 crisis, when the European Banking Authority was being asked to stress test all the major European banks, take one of those banks, Deutsche Bank, 250 employees who work on regulation, and then ask how many regulators were there, how many full-time employees were there in the European Banking Authority. Have a guess. Who would guess 100? 200? There were six. Okay, government will always have fewer people with less information and less expertise. So what that requires is really smart government. Don't think about controlling government. Think about what I like to call regulatory judo, where you use the weight of sectors against themselves or to regulate themselves. Think about what is, not what should the government do in this area, but what is the minimum that we need government to do effectively in order to catalyze this sector to enforce against each other. In other words, give a proprietary interest, if it's financial services, give a proprietary interest on banks to hold each other to account. Make that part of your regulatory framework so that you're not constantly facing a government which is always, by definition, under-resourced, under-informed, and not expert enough to do its job. So that's a very, so this idea of minimum government, maximum govern, govern, governance, I think speaks to this idea that you can leverage government. But leveraging government takes people like the people in this room, the intellectual force of a country, to really think what is the necessary minimum that we need government to do, instead of asking, what is the whole universe of things that it might be nice if government does? 
And the third thing I think that's alluring about the slogan is the idea that you reallocate responsibility <coughs> away from the government and to citizens, to other groups, to the private sector, that the responsibilities of a well-governed, well-functioning society should not all reside with government. They should reside right across the society. And the citizens of any society have to keep fighting to be, and acting to be a good society for any polity to work. And I think that is also part of this idea, and it's an alluring one for that reason. So let me then just let me talk about three things that are less attractive or that you could interpret this slogan to mean when it perhaps wasn't intended for them to mean, but I think it gives us some caveats. So the first is those who say minimum government, oh, that's anti-government. This is a throwback to the 1980s anti-government <coughs> ideology that says there is nothing that governments do that the private sector couldn't do better. We need to roll back government. So it brings up um, the image of, I remember when the World Bank was advocating strong rollbacks in the African public sector and a West African president took the World Bank president round his country and said very proudly, look at my civil servants, they're all self-financing. Now think about what that means, right? The completely corrupt, self-financing civil service. This is not obviously where you want to head. But I think a more germane example for India, when you think about what it means to try to reduce government, is to really learn from countries like the United Kingdom that have tried repeatedly to do this. So my colleague, Professor Christopher Hood at Oxford, has done a 10-year study of the seven major public sector reforms that Britain has undertaken. So seven huge root and branch civil service reforms Every single one of these reforms has aimed to reduce the costs of the, private, of the public sector and to reduce the staffing numbers of the public sector and to increase the responsiveness. And those three things he tests. And he says, has this ever worked? What I would headline is that one of the, very, the, one of the clearest findings of his study is that every one of these seven reforms has increased the costs of government. Even the reforms that successfully reduce the number of people working in government. And the reason it's increased the costs of government, and this they're, they're now working on at the moment, is because the government has simply passed whole responsibilities and duties, reduced the civil service and employed management consultants to step in and do that work. And it turns out, perhaps it's not surprising, but it's very interesting to see it rigorously laid out that the management consultancy option is far more expensive. And why that's interesting is because the impetus to do the reform has been to reduce costs. The outcome has been an increase in costs. And so then you've got to ask yourself, was the responsiveness of government and the quality of government improved by that process? And on that, they actually have some pretty ambiguous results. Some moderate successes and some clear failures. So I think learning from that experience is really important. I think a second fear that people have about the minimum government, maximum governance, is that it permits a government to shy away from responsibility. In other words, it permits a government to retreat back and say, sorry, Healthcare or education, that's not our responsibility anymore. That's their responsibility or prisons or... And we can see the different parts of government services, not just in Britain, but in the United States and in other countries that have been privatized and permitted government ministers and governments to step back and say, well, that wasn't our responsibility anymore. But that doesn't necessarily come with the terrain. That simply requires that as the government moves to undertake these reforms, it's up to everyone in this room and those working with and around government to ensure that government continues to take responsibility for those things that government has to take responsibility for. And that's why the act of citizenship implied in the, in the alluring qualities is so important. And finally, I think 
the other, the, the final fear that people have about the idea of minimum government is that it will mean a government stepping back from some of the things that only a government can do. And I'm talking not about delivery, which is the one that people focus on, but the role of a government in framing the challenges that face a society, the role of government in framing not just the foreign policy of a country, but framing the identity of a nation, framing what the aspirations of the government can and should be, helping to frame crises and challenges which um, face a people as a whole. And I think there, minimum government cannot be minimum government in face of that, because government is the only body there that can speak with one clear voice which is not associated or shouldn't be associated with any specific vested interest. And so the capacity of the government to frame and to speak for the collective interest of the nation as a whole is a really important one. And occasionally, in much smaller governments, where there have been attempts to roll back government, the government has even tried to roll back from that. And I think that's very problematic. And it's particularly problematic in a country that, that, you know, that has a lot of potential cleavages and where that framing is so important. So I'll stop there. Uh, thank you, Nair. Uh, I, I won't ask you to answer this question now. We'll come back to it. But you know, the evidence you're pointing to on the UK experience, uh, do we have uh, s some set of uh, areas where reform has actually generally proven to have worked? Uh, you know, I think that would be very useful for us as we start thinking about our, our own sort of public uh, service reform process. Uh, but Pratap, let me come to you uh, and you know, ask you to share. Uh, thanks. Wonderful being at Brookings. Um, I'll just sort of make three sets of remarks, really, kind of just opening up the, uh, the, the, the discussion a little bit. Uh, uh, and one way of framing this is the following, which is I, I'm never sure what minimum government means, by the way. I, you know, it, it's like Sidhu will remember the debates over nuclear deterrence. Is it credible minimum deterrence or minimum credible deterrence? A lot hangs on how you define um, minimum government. But I just want to say that I think there's a context in which we are talking of governance reform in India and minimum government, max, maximum governance. And I think it's good to be reminded of what that context is because that can then shape what it is that we are looking for. And I think there are three aspects to this context. The first is a, what I would call a kind of architectural shift in the structure of government. Uh, very briefly put, we had a governance system, or a system of government, if you like, that was based on a number of <coughs> principles which were reflected in its design. And those principles, very simply put, can be described as centralization, very wide discretion, uh, relatively little transparency, or rather put it this way, the asymmetry of information about government between government and so civil society was in government's favor. Okay. Uh, what has become very clear to us is that any system of governance that is founded on these principles is likely to come to grief very quickly. So central, in opposition to centralization, there is a clamor for participation. Let's put it this way. I won't use the term decentralization. It's much more complicated, because you can think of regulatory institutions as providing fora for the articulation of public reason. Instead of wide discretion, there is now a demand that government action be justified. And almost all the governance blockages that you have seen are, in some senses, cases of imperfect justifications or the idea that you did not need to justify anything at all. Why you gave somebody land, why you gave somebody a mine, why you gave somebody an oil license, how you fixed gas prices, every single one of those aspects, right? The era of discretion, as we understood it traditionally, is over. And the era of, in a sense, secrecy is over which is, you can fool people, some people some of the time, but not all of the people all of the time. And the balance of information and knowledge between civil society and government has shifted vastly in favor of 
civil society in a country like India, right? So if you continue to govern on old, uh, old architectural principles of centralization, wide discretion and secrecy, and mind you, these were self-reinforcing. You can have centralization because you don't have to justify. You can get away with it in part because you have secrecy. You're not going to be able to govern. And the question is, are your new administrative practices that you're going to put in place the kind that actually allow you to make the transition from centralization to more participatory, wide discretion to decisions that are, in a sense, backed up by public justification, which all those who are affected by those decisions can freely accept, right? And transparency, in, not, not in just in the sense of transparency of bureaucratic processes, but an ability to take on board all the available knowledge at a given time, ex ante, in the right kind of way. And that's, in a sense, the big transition. Now, unfortunately, I think in India, what we mean by governance reform is actually what we call quick decision making, right? which does not involve these three principles. It's, it's trying to find a shortcut for an old, broken system. And everything that we are seeing by way of minimum government right now in this government is actually an example of that. And it's going to come to grief very soon. You cannot not do environmental regulation in a modern economy. You cannot say that ministers alone or cabinet alone can speed up, you know, Anil, Anil wrote a column on this today, 150 decisions in one day, because it fulfills some criteria of minimum governance. Right? The days of shortcuts are over. The long run transition that we need to make to a new form of governance are catching up with us. The second point I'll, I'd like to sort of place on the table, and I think it's worth mentioning this in a context like this, particularly amongst you know, colleagues and think tanks. And this is a point I think we don't often pay enough attention to in a country like India. Uh, in some ways, politicians and bureaucrats are very easy culprits to identify. Right? Bureaucratic structures that don't have performance uh, matrices, accountability, politicians that are governed by venial interests and so forth, right? But if I look back over our failures over the last 10 years and say, okay, what aspect of governance failed precisely, apart from this, this kind of incomplete transition that I just talked about? I would argue, actually, that our biggest weakness is in cultures of intellectual negotiation that underpin government policy and government processes. And what do I mean by that? I have a very specific view in mind, which is, which is the following. On any given policy regime, let's say you're designing an education system. You know, there's a debate over primary education in India, how to best deliver it. And there's a, there's a very high level abstract debate which we conduct as intellectuals, you know, public models versus private models, voucher systems versus public, right? I myself come to the view that, you know, most likelihood, the evidence one way or the other is going to be indeterminate. There's always the one social science question you have to ask about any finding, which is under what conditions. I mean, that's the only social science question, actually, right? But what happens in cultures of negotiation in government policy? What happens in cultures of negotiation in government policy is, even if bureaucrats are well-intentioned, even if politicians don't have venial interests, is they will take two forms of opposing intellectual argument and try and construct a hybrid out of it, which is worse than any one of those two solutions winning. Right? So I'm quite happy to say, look, if you can get a public system to run and you understand these are the eight conditions that will require a public system to be a success, and you can put them in a place, go ahead. Or if you're going to do a voucher system, do you understand that a voucher system will run if you can do reform A, B, and C with it? Right? What instead government will end up producing, as we did with the Right to Education Act, was a regulatory architecture that has a mix of private, a mix of public, in the wrong combination, because it is some kind of compromise that will actually appease all constituents. And that design problem, and given the kinds of problems that we face, the wicked problems, urbanization, environment, education, what's the characteristic of these problems? There are multiple, multiple pathways to a good solution, right? Most of the effectiveness of these interventions 
actually come to light only 10 years after the program has actually been done. Right? So you don't have this, this illusion that you can do evidence-based correction at six months' notice. Right? Under such circumstances, right, can you think of the integrity, the internal integrity of design? Right? And I'm afraid, actually, our intellectual cultures don't actually foster that. I mean, we really do produce camels. And, and, and which are meant to sail on sea, not, not actually you know, run, 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 run in the desert. But the one corrosive consequence that has had in our governance structures is that the basic principles that make an institution the, have the energy it does have been completely eroded. So private sector works in areas where the profit motive you know, is effective, right? It's, a, it's an adequate motive, an appropriate motive. Civil society works where voluntary persuasion, right, is the name of the game. I mean, I'm simplifying a bit, but that's the modus operandi of civil society. We persuade each other. And the state works where you have something which is backed by democratic, democratic legitimacy and coercion, right, both. In our kind of let's put it this way, temptation to create camels. What are we doing? We are inserting the principle of coercion in areas where voluntary persuasion should work. Right? Minimum government is going to mean CSIR will do slum redevelopment in Bombay. I'm sorry, I have a problem. Not only do I have a problem, you know it's designed to fail. Right? Yeah? And I think that confusion of roles where, where in a sense the motivation underlying every every institution that makes it the institution that it is, that gives it its raison d'etre and distinctiveness, when you blur that to a point, it completely actually erodes the professional identity of all those of institutions. So now we have companies that are actually beginning to behave like bureaucracies, foundation worlds that used to experiment, encumbered with actually the, the big weight of government, and government, on the other hand, being totally transactional and profit maximum, right? And that, I think, is a big, big, big worry in this, you know, in this kind of attempt to tick off slogans, PPPs. Where are PPPs appropriate? Maybe some forms of road construction? Education? Absolutely not. It's going to be a big joke. Right? Yeah. So that's my second worry. Third and final point on this maximum governance thing, and I think this is one thing Prime Minister Modi has got right, which is India's biggest challenge is not market failure, it's not state failure. Those are two big challenges. It's actually social failure, right? A country where the state has to teach sanitation. A country if where if a teacher shows up in the classroom and still does not teach, right? You, you know, right? It's not about showing, but shows up and still does not open their mouths, right? What kind of minimum government are you going to expect, right? In a sense that statism has its roots in a deep pathology, deep social pathology. You can talk about lack of trust, inequality, and so forth. And unfortunately, that pathology is also being reproduced in a very crucial set of institutions that are, that are really important for governance, which are our professional institutions. When you look at the evolution of capitalism in the United States, even in Europe, I mean, Durkheim said in the 19th century, modern morality is going to be the morality of profession. Right, where self-interest and identity combine to create a set of norms. What is a doctor supposed to be doing qua doctor? What is a lawyer supposed to be doing qua lawyer, an officer of the court? Right. The biggest crisis for India is that is the complete breakdown of those prof institutions of professional self-governance that are the bedrock of any modern society. Uh, which, in a sense, fuse, fuse the self-interest and the public interest through a professional identity. Right? Yeah. And I think we need to ask a deeper question about why that. I, I don't think the blame is at the government's door. I mean, when I think of the history of my own profession, higher education in India, I can blame politicians all I want, but at the end of the day, it was our self abstication as a community of professionals where we came to the conclusion that the university was about everything but the cultivation of the intellect. Right? That, in a sense, the corrosion of that regulatory structure began. Right? And how do you, in a sense, catalyze a conversation or institutional regeneration in that middle space? 
Because if you don't have that middle space right, believe me, you, you not just have big government, you will have, uh, as it were, strong and authoritarian government down the line. Uh, thank you, Pratap. <coughs> Number of very deep issues, as usual, will get to, I'm sure, to some of them as we get in the Q&A. Pradeep Ghosh, uh, thank you for coming. So I'll be speaking on civil service reforms in India. And of course, uh, you know, uh, I have interpreted this, uh, uh, this mandate actually you know, in a very, very narrow sense. So I'm not sure that there will be too many connections with what the two previous uh, speakers uh, have just said. Uh, now, first of all, let me start <coughs> by, you know, by making some conceptual distinctions between the notions of administrative reforms, governance reforms, and civil service reforms. I believe that you know, they are in sort of concentric subsets conducted by a dedicated agency which is independent of the actual employer. And the formal educational or professional uh, qualifications are prescribed for each cadre and for each position. And there's a structured and formal system of reckoning performance. Promotions, again, are by a structured process taking account of seniority and performance. The second is that they cannot be fired easily. That is, they cannot be fired without cause and without following a due quasi-judicial process. And if the position has become redundant, then they cannot be fired without proper compensation. A third is political independence, at least formally. And that is, a civil servant cannot be a member of a political party while being a civil servant. And if found to be directly furthering the interests of any political party, that is cause enough for being fired. <coughs> now, when we speak of civil service reforms in India, I do not see that there is any debate that these fundamental features need to be altered. We are not in a situation where the debate advocates a US-based spoil system or an Australian service contracting system, and nor is anyone you know, uh, advocating a corporate-style hire-and-fire approach to the civil service in India. So by civil service reform, we are actually talking of something else. Now, there is a lot of talk about how bloated the Indian civil servants are, how bloated the civil service is. I think you know, some, a little international comparison will actually put this matter in perspective. According to a report in The Hindu of 30th January 2012, the central government in India had 257 civil servants per 100,000 persons, as compared to the US federal government, which had 840 civil, service, civil servants per 100,000 persons. So that is just, so, in, so the numbers of Indian civil servants as a proportion to population are just 30% of the US, um, comparing federal to federal. Now the central government has in all about 3.11 million civil servants, of which 1.39 persons are railway employees. And strictly, they perform you know, quasi-commercial uh, contracts, you know, quasi-commercial functions. And you know, they are not really considered to be typically core civil service functions. And there are also some uh, quarter million people who are employed in the postal department. There are also large numbers of persons who are employed by the central police and security services. They are also counted in 3.11 million. So if you remove from consideration all these civil servants who are, who are just by technical definition civil servants, the numbers of people who collect taxes, who provide, say, metro services, who man the nuclear and space establishments, who uh, provide agricultural research and extension, who provide the manpower for the central universities, schools, and hospitals, those who provide judicial services in the higher courts and tribunals, those who enforce environmental regulations, those who account for and audit the public finances, is in fact quite small. And of this aggregate strength, fully 60% are at the Group C or clerical level. And some 30% are at the Group D or the, or the you know, uh, mailroom uh, boy level. Okay. So the numbers of civil servants who could actually be considered to be professionals, that is called, they are called group A, who are required to be university graduates and who generally receive training for two years after recruitment in their respective service academies or otherwise are located in scientific and technical establishments is perhaps 
less than 100,000 in all. And the IS, which is you know, pretty much at the, you know, is targeted by you know, a lot of people who feel that all, the, all that is wrong in India, in Indian governance, can be traced to the IS, has just 4,700 persons. The IPS, you know, another favorite uh, you know, uh, target of, uh, you know, of those who find fault with the government, has just 3,600 persons. Each is short of its sanction strength by about 30%. And of these all in the service officers, only about 25% serve the central government at any point in time. And the rest are with the state governments, with, uh, with quasi-government bodies, with international organizations, and so on. Now, so let's, so I have tried to define this animal that we're talking about when we speak of civil service uh, reforms. Now let's break up this animal of civil service reforms into civil context, uh, civil components. And of course, I'm not claiming that these are exhaustive. So first is the question of skill sets. And the contention is that Indian civil servants are generally insufficiently skilled to cope with either the modern means of delivery of public services or policy making in today's complex world. As far as the first is concerned, because we are now we are talking of the delivery or cutting edge of administration, I think experience shows otherwise. Because railways several years ago put in place an efficient online ticketing system with some training of existing staff. They didn't need to recruit a whole pile of new people to support the new ticketing system. Similarly, the IT department, though it could be a lot more user friendly than it is, have in the last few years established a fairly robust system of online submission of IT returns. And even the DDA, reputedly the most cussed of Government of India establishments, has com now commissioned an online system of submissions and computerized system of processing of applications for its low-cost housing schemes. Now, the point is there needs to be a thrust from the higher levels of government to bring about reforms in systems and procedures. But the experience so far is that the existing skill sets of the persons at the operational level have not stood in the way. Now let me turn to policy making. Now it is arg argued that in today's world, policy making requires inputs from multiple disciplines. This is true, but this is a point that I have made repeatedly. One needs to keep in mind that two attributes of policy makers are even more important than their disciplinary skills. The first is actual and very substantial administrative experience in actual implementation of public policy measures. A person without administrative experience, to my mind, cannot really uh, be relied upon to make sound policy. The second is deep internalization of the public interest in, specific political, in, in the specific political and social context. One needs to understand that like, there's a very, very complex and dynamic what? cloud out there called the public interest. And one must be fully immersed in it for a very long period of time, you know, must, must breathe the public interest for many years before one could be considered to have a sufficient, you know, to have internalized it sufficiently. And the point is that neither aspect can be imparted to classroom training. But let me return to the question of skills. When I entered the civil service in 1969, I was a kind of odd man out in the batch. I was the first chemical engineer to be recruited into the IS, the only engineer, in fact, among a bevy of graduates in history, English literature, political science, with a sprinkling of economists and scientists. One of the most distinguished e of these economists actually lives down the road here. In the 1990s, I used to, several, you know, several decades after that, I used to lecture at the LBS Academy, when I found that the class was divided into four sections. Two were comp comp comprised entirely of engineers, the third of persons with other professional degrees, such as MBAs, doctors, agronomists, and so on. And the last comprised persons with traditional liberal arts and sciences degrees. Now, this was obviously, this was obviously, you know, from one unbalanced situation, it had gone to another unbalanced situation. But what had, what had actually changed? It was simply that the choice of papers available in the civil service examinations had changed. And so you had people from different backgrounds coming in. Now, a few years later, the UPSC adopted a scheme of normalization of scores that restored a measure of balance 
and at present about half the entrants comprise persons with professional degrees and about and the other half are people with traditional liberal arts and sciences backgrounds. And I think that that is an appropriate disciplinary mix for civil studies. But the entry stage civil skill sets are one thing. How the skill sets, and here I'm talking about formal university-based skill sets, how they evolve over the careers of civil servants is another. For one, the government has put in place mandatory requirements of in-service training for all gr Group A services at four stages in their career. And these last several months on each occasion and include attachments for specific modules to universities in Europe and the US. Second, the government, through various ODA programs, sent civil servants on master's levels programs in relevant disciplines to universities in the US, UK, and Europe, and on its own to several Indian universities. And in fact, a class I was taking earlier in the afternoon pertained to one such group of civil servants. Third, the government is extremely generous with long-term, long, partly paid leave for civil servants to produce, to pursue graduate and doctoral studies. And in fact, actually pays the major part of fees for the first year of the program in universities abroad. Now, these measures for in-service advancement of skills is probably not matched by any private agency in India and probably by very few governments worldwide. And as a consequence, I assert with some confidence and the numbers of senior civil servants in India with graduate and doctoral degrees from the top 100 global universities, the IITs and the IIMs, cannot be matched by the three largest industrial houses in India put together or by any Indian university. And to illustrate this, I point to the fact that it's not by accident that FIKI has selected two former civil servants for its two senior professional positions, the Secretary General and, Dir and Director General, and NASCOM too has done the same, a very technical, uh, you know, te technical uh, uh, industry body like NASCOM has chosen a former civil servant to become its Secretary General. Now let me turn to the second issue, which is the use of formal knowledge in policy making. It's of course one thing to have a wide range of skills in government and another to ensure that they, actually, that they are actually brought to bear in policy making. And this has three aspects. First, to ensure that civil servants with the relevant domain knowledge are placed in the relevant positions. Second, that rigorously research knowledge is available to persons making policy. And third, the lateral induction of persons outside the government into policy making positions. On the first aspect, to my mind, the present system is definitely wanting. At present, there are joint secretaries in the energy ministries who are innocent of the laws of thermodynamics. And so we have a bizarre article in today's newspapers about somebody suggesting that we can have windmills along railway lines to generate power as the trains rush by. I think this, well, I mean, it's, it's uh, the fact that it, it, it actually at, at all has merited discussion with the government is probably an indication that you don't necessarily have the right people everywhere in government. And at the same time, the Department of Culture has IIT mechanical engineers appointed as joint secretaries, one of whom last year was my student. Now this is hardly an optimal use of human resources, and I believe it has arisen from a practice of deferment to the wishes of the minister in charge in making civil uh, senior level appointments. Now there are several commissions and committees which have sought to address this problem. The Surindranath Committee, which gave its report way back in 2006, uh, in which I served, proposed the creation of 11 domains within the central staffing scheme. And for example, some of these are agriculture and rural development, the social sectors, that is health, education, and the civil servant of identified accordingly. This aspect of the Surindranath Committee recommendations has not been implemented. However, it is possible that the present government may do so. I mean, I you know, hope springs eternal, I guess. On the second aspect, I don't think it's feasible for civil servants to themselves conduct public policy research while attending to the overall process of policy making. This requires resources, time, and professional researchers. At present, there's a clear shortage of competent, multidisciplinary policy research organizations in India. And this is my humble opinion. I serve in one of the largest of those, Terry, but I believe that the field is, is, is not exactly crowded. The gaggle of commercial consulting organizations exists in full strength, and I speak 
and when I say this, I speak from some experience. They are generally believed in the government as purveyors of quick and dirty research and far from rigorous. University researchers, again, the experience of people in the government who have engaged them is that they tend to be trapped within the confines of their respective disciplines and seem to be. Yeah, yeah, okay, I'll just, I'll just, I'll, I'm not going to. And they seem to be unaware of the imperatives of time-bound policy making. And unless the quality and usefulness of the policy research that is conducted by Indian institutions improves dramatically, I see little hope for greater demand by the government for outsourced policy research. On the third aspect of, of, uh, of uh, lateral recruitments, I think there's an increasing practice of engaging in-house consultants to provide specified disciplinary inputs. Typically, these are younger persons who are contracted for two to three years. However, it's still rare for a total outsider to the government system to be assigned to an apex policy-making role. And not that this has never happened, but there is a real concern about how deeply exposed such persons are to the realities of political life and public administration and their understanding of the center of gravity of the public interest. I believe it is this concern and not capture of the political executive by the civil servants that accounts for the majority of position of market regulators in India being held by former civil servants. <laughs>